Thank you guys so much. I am from California. Don't hold that against me. Uh, I know we don't have the greatest reputation in America, but I feel like a missionary to California. I'm not originally from California. I feel like God called me there as a missionary, uh, so it's great. You know, there's a lot of talk about how dark America is getting spiritually and, and you know, decisions the Supreme Court is making and where America is going culturally and as a nation. And, you know, there's a lot of people very scared, nervous, and afraid. And I, I feel like the darker our nation gets spiritually, the greater opportunity we have as a church of Jesus Christ to shine. Because light works best in darkness. And I want to say I am so thrilled to see a church like Cornerstone here. And really what they say, if you, if you study missiology and you talk to you know, people uh, in, in that world, they say the Northeast is the darkest place spiritually in America. And I've talked to many of you this week, and, and you've, you've assured me that, yes, this is not an easy place to live for Jesus. And to see a church like this that is so br- vibrant and full of life and making a difference in this community and led by one of the great pastors of our nation. I tell you, you got a pastor who loves you deeply. He is not stopped talking about you since I have met this man, and he really cares for you and wants to serve you. And so let's let's give Pastor Eric a hand right now and just let him know how much we appreciate him. And so I'm thrilled. I'm very humbled to be just a small part of what God is doing here through this church. And I want to I want to talk a little bit. You know, he talked a lot about what we've done in Los Angeles through the Dream Center and what we've seen at our church there in the San Diego area. And I want to give you a little inside secret to our success. You've got to have the right prayer partner. If you have the right prayer partner, there's there's amazing things that God can use you to do in your life and your career and your family and your marriage and in all different areas. And so I want to begin today by, by simply, you know, making a statement that I want you to chew on for a moment. This could be the greatest year of your life if it's the greatest year of your life spiritually. And I think that's true. I think if this became the greatest year of your life spiritually, this without a doubt would be the greatest year of your life. If you got closer to Jesus this year than you've ever been before, and you got stronger spiritually than you've ever been before, there's no telling what your life could be like. There's there's no telling what could happen when God is in it in such a powerful and a deep way. And so I want to talk about the greatest prayer partner you'll ever have. Jesus in John chapter 16, verses 5 through 7 said, Now I'm going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. Like you're upset, you're sad because I told you that I'm going to leave you, but in fact, it is best for you. It is best for you that I, Jesus, go away because if I don't, the advocate, that's one of the words Jesus used to describe Holy Spirit, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. I'll send him to you. Have you ever wondered why Jesus would say, it's best for you that I leave? Wouldn't you imagine that if you could spend three years of your life with Jesus, like three years with him, flesh and blood, like eat with him and walk with him and talk to him and ask him questions and listen to him teach firsthand and watch him perform miracles, wouldn't you imagine that if you had that type of access to Jesus Christ and flesh and blood and he was personally discipling you, your life would be better? Like, couldn't you imagine that if I could spend three years with Jesus, my life would be radically, radically different? The disciples had that opportunity. The disciples spent three years with Jesus, flesh and blood, listening to him teach, watching him perform miracles. And after three years of being with Jesus, they abandoned him in his darkest hour. Now it's starting to make sense why Jesus says it's so much better for you that I leave and I send the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit can do something in your life that even I in flesh and blood can't do. You see, Jesus was working from the outside in. The Holy Spirit works from the inside 
out. And so Jesus is saying, if you'll get the Spirit in your life in such a powerful, amazing, incredible way, it will change every aspect of your life. But here's the problem. The problem that many of us have, and I was talking to somebody after the last service and said, I've always struggled with the Holy Spirit, is the English translation of the word spirit. You see, when you study the Bible, the Old Testament portion of the Bible was written in ancient Hebrew and ancient Aramaic. The New Testament was written in ancient Greek. If you look at this word spirit in the Bible, it's translated over 800 times. In the Hebrew, there's a word for it. In the Greek, there's a word for it translated over 800 times. And the word spirit isn't the most accurate word. It's actually a word the translators made up to describe the Greek and the Hebrew word, and it's a word that confuses many of us today, because I don't know about you, but I grew up, I didn't want ghosts in my house or spirits in my house. Those scared me. Like, I didn't want any, I did not want to be around ghosts or spirits. And so when I went to church and they started talking about Holy Spirit, I was like, can I have two-thirds of God? Like, I'll take the Father and I'll take the Son, but keep the Holy Spirit away from me because that just sounds spooky and scary. Well, the problem is the English translation of the word. When you look at the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for spirit is the word ruach, ruach, which literally translated means wind, breath, a violent exhalation, or a blast of breath. It's used in the second verse of the Bible, Genesis 1, verse 2. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep, and the spirit, Ruach, of God was hovering over the surface of the waters, or the breath of God. The wind of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. The power is in the breath. When God said, let there be light, when you speak words out loud, you release your breath. You see, it was the breath of God. When he said, let there be light, it was the breath that had power. That's why Jesus said, you're not have whatever you believe, but you'll have whatever you say. Say to the mountain, not believe the mountain will be removed in your life, but say to the mountain, be thou removed. This is a powerful principle. In the New Testament, the Greek word for spirit means pneuma, and its translation is a current of air a blast of breath, or a strong breeze. So if you really want to translate the Spirit correctly, it would be Father, Son, and Holy Breath, or Father, Son, and Holy Wind. So I get why the translators created the word Spirit, but it's not the most accurate word. And as a result, so many of us are confused today by who the Holy Spirit is, and so many of us don't even look at Him as a real person. We look at Him as an it. Like, he's not even a real person. Like, we understand Father, we understand Son, but so many of us struggle with the Holy Spirit being an actual person, having feelings and having emotions and having a distinct personality separate from God the Father and separate from God the Son, that he is a person and you can grieve him and you can quench him and he has personality to who he is. So let me do my best, and, and I'm so inadequate. I don't think anybody can adequately really reveal who he is apart from him. So I pray that he'll just mix my words today with who he is and reveal himself to you in such a powerful way. Jesus in John 6, verse 63 says, The Spirit, pneuma, the wind of God, the breath of God gives life. So if you're stuck, stuck in your marriage, stuck emotionally, stuck spiritually, the breath of God can literally breathe life into you. He goes on to say the flesh, that's your efforts. That's what you can do in your own ability. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, are pneuma, are wind, are breath, and they are life. Jesus is saying, I'm not just giving you great ideas to contemplate and ideas to think about. I'm giving you words that have the very power of of fulfillment laced into the words. See, the Bible that you possess is not another book. It's not just white pages full of black ink, but it's literally living and breathing. There is breath in the Bible that breathes life inside of you, and this is such an incredible concept. But here's the problem. Here's the disconnect. How do you describe wind to somebody that's never been outside? Do you ever imagine trying to describe wind to somebody that's never been outside? It's kind of like, well, no, well, it's, it's, it's more like, ah, I just, you just got to come outside and feel it. I, I can't really tell you, but you just got to experience it. And that's what the Holy Spirit is like in our life. So let me give you three characteristics about wind 
that are also true about the Holy Spirit to help you build this relationship so he can become the greatest prayer partner of your life. The first thing about wind that is true is wind is unseen. You can't see wind. And the same is true for the Holy Spirit. And that creates a huge problem for people because we've set a filter, especially as modern Americans, that we won't accept anything we can't logically understand or figure out. So let me explain this. God wanted there to be a a part of who he is that you will never logically, intellectually figure out. And I'm glad he did it this way because if I could completely comprehend God with my little brain, he would not be that great because my brain is working with limited capacity. I want a God that is bigger than my human brain. I want a God that is bigger than my human logic. I want a God that that far exceeds what I have the ability to understand because that's a God worthy of greatness, worthy of glory, worthy of giving him my entire life. I mean, who wants a Christian experience uh, that, 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 that doesn't have that factor going on? So the wind is unseen. Let me give you another characteristic about wind. Wind is unpredictable. Wind is unpredictable. It's one of the most difficult things for pilots at at airports to do is land in crosswinds because the wind can change so unpredictably, and the same is true of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is unpredictable at times, and that can mess you up because so many of us want everything to be neat and orderly and to fit nicely into a little box. And Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 8, the wind, and this is the only time in the entire New Testament the word pneuma is translated as wind. Every other time the translators use the word spirit. So he says the wind or the spirit blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit or born of the breath or born of the wind. You have to learn to be comfortable in your faith that you're not going to be able to pin him down to a certain way of doing things every single time. I mean, there was one time God decided to speak through a burning bush. He'd never done it before, and he's never done it since. See, the problem today is if we had a burning bush experience, we would try to create it every single week in church. This is the only way God can speak. If you don't have a burning bush, God has not spoken to you because we love to institutionalize movements of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves a certain way at a church or a certain way one Sunday, and we want to turn it into a box and say this is the only way the Holy Spirit can move, and if he doesn't move this way, it's not him. There was a time some, a guy brought his friend to Jesus who was blind, wanted Jesus to heal him. He'd seen Jesus do miracles before. He'd seen Jesus lay his hands on people, and, and they'd be healed, so he brought him to Jesus. said, Jesus, Jesus, do the hand thing. Do the hand thing. Put your hand on him. Jesus says, you think it's the hand. Let me mess you up big time. And Jesus spits into the dirt, makes little mud pies, puts mud pies in the guy's eye, and freaks everyone out to heal him because you can't put him in a box. And here's the third thing about wind that is also true about the Holy Spirit. Wind is powerful. Wind is powerful. Wind can generate electricity. Wind can sail a ship. Wind can destroy a city. I'm amazed at the destructive ability of wind. You need to understand the God that you and I serve is powerful. I have got no interest in serving a dead, lifeless God. If there's not a supernatural element to our life, why are we here? We don't need another club to learn how to become better people. We need the power of God in our life. And the supernatural should not freak you out. Supernatural, the, the definition is just beyond your natural ability. It's not, it doesn't have to be weird sci-fi stuff. It's just this is what you have the natural ability to accomplish. And then with God in your life, you have the ability to accomplish more than you would naturally accomplish without God in your life. See, there's a major danger of us trying to create an intellectual gospel a gospel that we can figure out. See, the problem with an intellectual gospel is you begin to create a God who looks like you and acts like you, and you put God in a box, and you want a God that, that, that does exactly what you want him to do because you want to be able to figure it all out. I love Charles Finney. He was one of the great revivalists of America in the 1800s, led massive revivals in America. Well, he struggled with Christianity at first. He was an intellectual. He was a lawyer. He questioned everything until he had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. He couldn't 
intellectually figure out it was something that he simply experienced. In his biography, here's what Charles Finney said. He said, the Holy Spirit descended upon me in a manner that seemed to go through me, body and soul. I could feel the impression like a wave of electricity going through and through me. Indeed, it seemed to come in waves and waves of liquid love. For I could not express it in any other way. And then he makes this statement that's so powerful. It seemed like the very breath of God. Do you know why it seemed like the very breath of God? Because it was the very breath of God. The Holy Spirit is the holy breath, the holy wind of who God is. And so if you're going to accomplish your life destiny, you're going to need power. You're going to need that relationship with the Holy Spirit. So here's my hope for you today as we, as we get ready to, to finish this message. Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says, the Spirit, the breath of God. You know, what? a great exercise for you to do is reread the New Testament, and every time you see the word Spirit, put in breath. Put the word breath in there. The breath of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as or the same amount of power that God used to raise Jesus Christ from the dead, he will breathe into you. He'll breathe into your life. He'll breathe into your marriage. He'll breathe into your your spiritual condition. He'll give life to your mortal bodies by this same breath that is living within you. So let me just quickly give you a couple benefits to the Holy Spirit becoming your prayer partner, to the Holy Spirit becoming intimate and in a close relationship with you. And can I say just very quickly, I hate that so many of us use the word the to describe the Holy Spirit. I think that's even in a, even because we don't say the Bob, like I have a relationship with the Pastor Eric, or I have a relationship with the man. We don't say the about somebody we're intimate with. We just say their name. And so I've I've practiced in, in relationship with them just to call them Holy Spirit. Instead of the Holy Spirit to make him an object, he's a person, he's a friend, he's a comforter, he is Holy Spirit. So let me give you just a couple benefits. First, I, I love this one, he'll teach you. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. When the Father sends the advocate, as my representative, John 14, 26 says, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything. And he will remind you of everything I told you. For those of you that have always wondered, how did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John remember everything Jesus said when they wrote it down years after Jesus? It's because the Holy Spirit reminded them of everything Jesus taught them. See, the Holy Spirit is an expert on every single subject. He'll give you words to say. He'll teach you. You'll be counseling a friend, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit gives you advice or gives you a a word of wisdom for them, and and you say, you know what? This is what I think you should do. And then they look at you with this this shock, like, how did you know? That's exactly what I needed to hear because the Holy Spirit can teach you all things. The Holy Spirit, let 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 me say to the men for a moment, Holy Spirit will be the greatest friend you'll ever have in your marriage. He'll tell you when to keep your mouth shut and not get yourself in trouble. There's so many times in my marriage that I wish I would have listened to him. I, I heard him whispering in my ear, I wouldn't say that right now if I were you. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't go there if I were you. That would have saved me a lot of pain and heartache if I would have just listened. He wants to help you in every area of your life. He's your friend. He'll help you at work. He'll help you with your children. He'll help you in your marriage. He is the best friend you'll ever have. He'll teach you all things. John 16, verse 13 says, he will tell you the future. Have you ever been blindsided and thought to yourself, I wish I would have known that before? He can teach you about the future. He can, he can teach you all things. We had a board member at the Dream Center in Los Angeles. He built cell phone towers in West Texas, and he was struggling. His company was struggling. It was going under. They were going bankrupt. They were in debt. They were just having a really difficult time. God asked him to do a couple things, and he took a step of faith and obeyed. And, and just his relationship with the Holy Spirit began to grow. And one day he was out talking to the Holy Spirit, and they were just walking and talking and, and praying in the Spirit. And all of a sudden, Holy Spirit gives him a vision for how to build a cell phone tower in three hours when it normally took eight hours for two-thirds the cost. I didn't even know the Holy Spirit could build cell phone towers. But obviously, he's quite an expert because he went out, tried it the next day. It worked, and he began to turn his company around. He began to beat out all of his competitors because he was building cell phone towers faster and cheaper than anyone else just because the Holy Spirit gave him a vision for how to do it. There's another businessman who was 
about 50 years ago, driving from Palm Springs to Los Angeles, just talking to the Spirit in the car, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, exit here. Well, he didn't want to exit because he had a business meeting, and he was late, and the Holy Spirit said exit. So he gets off the freeway. It's a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. He drives to the end of this dirt road. He's sitting on a hill. He, he gets out of his car. He's waiting for the Holy Spirit to say something. He's getting frustrated. He's like, okay, what do you want? I'm late for a meeting. Tell me what you need to tell me so I can get on the road and be on my way. And all of a sudden, sitting on the car, the Holy Spirit, it was like just opened his eyes. And in the valley, he had this vision of a city. He saw the post office and the grocery store and the school and housing communities. As a businessman, he knew exactly what it meant. He went to all of the farmers in the area, and he bought up all the land for pennies on the dollar. When the city of Los Angeles grew and it grew and it grew, he began to sell off the land piece by piece and literally made millions because the Holy Spirit gave him a vision for where the city would grow. I'm telling you, he, and, and please understand my heart. The Holy Spirit is not a lottery ticket. Do not use him like a lottery ticket. Build a friendship with him. Build a relationship with him. He wants to give you success in every area of your life, in your marriage, in your parenting, and so many. He will teach you. Let me give you another benefit quickly of him, and then i got to move on. I can't finish all of these. But this one is so important for so many of us. He will convict you of righteousness. So many times we talk about the Holy Spirit convicting us of sin. Do you know there's not one scripture in the Bible that says the Holy Spirit convicts Christians of sin? There's not one verse in the entire Bible that says the Holy Spirit convicts Christians of sin. It says the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, and it's one sin not believing in Jesus. Let me show you this to you. John 16, verses 8 through 11. And when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me, so that's the unsaved. Righteousness is now available because I go to the Father. That's for the believers. And you will see me no more, and judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. So judgment is for Satan, righteousness is for believers, and sin is for those who don't believe yet. Why is that so important? If you want to energize your prayer life, you have to understand your righteousness. So many of us don't have a passionate prayer life because we don't feel worthy. We don't feel good enough. We made mistakes this week. I sinned this week. I, I did something wrong this week. God's not going to hear me this week. i got to start over and try over next week. Because I'm not good enough. You have to understand, every time the Apostle Paul taught the word righteous, he always used the Greek version of noun, never the Greek version of verb. You need to understand this. Righteousness is not something you do. Righteousness is something you are because of something Jesus did. You are righteous. Let me put it like this. When you accept Jesus Christ, when you are born again, when you're born the first time, you're given a last name. That's your family identity. When you're born again, you're given a new last name, which becomes your family identity. And the new last name you're given when you're born again is righteous. You are righteous, not because you obeyed really well this week, not because you worked really hard, not because of your performance. You are righteous because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And the more you allow the Holy Spirit to convict you of your righteousness, that even when you sin, even when you mess up, even when you make mistakes, there is therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You are righteous. Your prayer life will go to a whole other level. You'll, as Hebrews says, come boldly into the throne room. You'll, you'll, you'll walk into the presence of God acting like you belong there. Why? Because you do. You don't belong there because of what you've done. You belong there because of what Jesus did. Jesus died to make you righteous. And one of the greatest gifts the Holy Spirit can give you is to convict you of your righteousness so that you can stand boldly in the presence of God. You can pray bold prayers. You can pray believing God listens to you. See, that's the problem. So many of us, we pray, we don't think God listens to us because we're not good enough. I'm not good enough. I've messed up. I'm not perfect. I'm struggling. I've got areas in my life that I'm still dealing with. And those things, Satan will use those to beat you up, to condemn you, to put shame on you. And shame kills your prayer life. But if you'll allow the Holy Spirit to convict you of righteousness, it'll change your entire, you'll pray differently because you're praying in the authority of Jesus. And because of what he did, you're not praying in your efforts or your abilities. So let me close by, by simply saying, how do I get this type of friendship with the Holy Spirit? 
How do I go there? Well, the first thing you need to do is you got to let go of fears and misconceptions. So many of us have seen a lot of weird stuff on television and a lot of weird stuff in church. I grew up Baptist, so, I mean, I had more to get over than anybody. I was actually taught that the Assembly of God people across the street were of the devil, like tongues was of the devil and the Holy Spirit. You just you know, you stay away from it. They talked about it like a disease. Like, you didn't want to catch it. You need to stay away from it. I had all sorts of issues to get over to, to build a friendship with the Holy Spirit. And when I realized that he was a very real person that wanted to be my friend, that wanted to come me and help me and teach me and guide me. It changed my life. So here's my advice to you. Take a blank page approach to the Bible. Forget everything you've ever heard. Forget everything you've ever seen. Forget everything you've ever been taught about the Holy Spirit. Open the Bible like it's, a, like it's the first time you've ever read it and just see what the Bible has to say. It'll change. Psalm 34, 4, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me and he freed me from all my fears. God will answer to you if you go to him. He'll free you from all the fears. Here's the second thing you're going to have to do to build a friendship with him. You've got to go all in. You have to go. You can't do it halfway. Christianity doesn't work by putting a toe in the water and testing it out. I have so many people who sit in my church every Sunday frustrated because they won't go all in. And they can't figure out why it's not working for me. I'm putting a toe in the water. Why isn't God showing up? Why isn't God blessing? Why is everyone else's life changing and everyone else's marriage changing and everyone else's family changing? And I'm not seeing any progress at all. Christianity is only designed to work at 100%. 99% isn't good enough. It's not I surrender some. It's I surrender all. And the reason it's I surrender all is because God won't accept anything else. God is either first place in your life or he's not in your life. Don't, don't kid yourself. You cannot squeeze God into second place in your life. You cannot squeeze God into third place in your life. It doesn't work that way. Would you want to give your life to a God that would allow himself leftovers? Do you want to surrender your life to a God that will take second place, that will take third place? It's all or it's nothing. Christianity is for radicals only. we got to go all in. To make it work, you've got to go all in. Jeremiah 29, 13 says it so clearly. You will seek me and you will find me. You'll find me. Again, if you find God in your marriage, would, would, would you agree with me that your marriage would be better? If you found God in your career, would you agree with me that your career would be better? If you found God in every area of your life, would your life be better? You will seek me and you will find me when. There's a huge condition to this. There's a massive condition right here. When you seek me with all, all, not some, not 80%, not 90%, not 99%. This only works when you seek me with all 100% of your heart. And then the last thing I can encourage you to do is develop an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. Get to know him as a person. He wants to be your friend. He's not spooky. He's not scary. He'll be the greatest friend you'll ever have. He'll comfort you when you're, when you're struggling. When you're hurting, he'll be there. He'll guide you. He'll teach you. He'll help you, you know, say the right things to your spouse and not say the wrong things if you listen to him. He wants to help so many areas of your life. He's the greatest friend you'll ever have, the greatest prayer partner. He'll help you pray. There's so many times I, I go to pray, and I think this is what I need to be praying, and I say, Holy Spirit, what do you think? I, this is what I was going to ask God for. What do you think I really need? And he'll begin to change my prayers. He'll begin to say, you know what? You don't really need that. This, this is what you need to be praying. And he gets my prayers in line with God. Because when my prayers are in line with God, they happen. They're answered. And so I, I, he's my prayer partner. I bounce my prayers off of him. Let me close with this first. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. This is, this is what every one of us needs. This is the dynamic we need with the Trinity. The amazing grace. The Trinity is, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the three personalities of God. He's three. He's one. Impossible to comprehend with the human mind. But let me, let me give you the best verse to describe it. The amazing grace of the master. That's the first step. We need salvation. We need the grace of Jesus. The extravagant love of God. God loves you so much. The Father loves you so much. He gave his only son for you. And then look at this. The intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit. And I was thinking this week, what, what's the greatest way to describe intimate friendship with Holy Spirit? This may sound funny, but hear me out. I think the relationship many of us need with the Holy Spirit is the relationship many of us have with our phone. 
Let's be honest. We'll be at dinner. Someone asks you a question. I don't know. Let me check. Let me check the weather. Let me find out this. Let me find out that. I mean, we literally go to our phone every couple minutes in our life to figure out something, to find something, to get advice, to get wisdom, to get answers. We literally depend. We have the most, we literally know every app and every feature and every setting on the phone. I mean, we study it. We play with it. What would happen if you began to treat the Holy Spirit the way you treat your phone? Can you imagine how better your life would be if you begin to develop that type of relationship with him? Like instead of going to the phone for every little thing, you went to him. You asked him, what do you think? What do you think I should do? Where do you think I should go? And let him be the friend that so many of us have allowed our phone to be. Let me close with one more verse. Isaiah 30, 21. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice. That's the Spirit of God, the breath of God. A voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. I pray that you'll build this friendship. I want to ask Pastor Eric to come and close this message today. Thanks so much, Aaron. And I don't know about you. When he talks talk about the phone, I start feeling convicted. Our iPhone in heaven. Hallowed be that. Okay, anyhow. But isn't it amazing, though, how we often go to our phone? We're frustrated. We go to our phone. We're happy we go to our phone. Wow. I mean, that's, that's enough to take home right there. We want to rely on God. You know, I don't know where you are today, but it takes, the, it takes the Holy Spirit to know God. And maybe some of you have never given your life to Jesus before. Maybe you know about Him. You know all about God. You can quote scriptures, but have you ever surrendered? I don't, let me just enjoy my life a little bit. Let me, go, let me get divorced first, and then I'll come to you, God. Let me get rid of this situation. Let me finish this, this shady deal I'm doing with, and then I'll come to you. Some of you are laughing because you know I've, I've, I've done it myself. But God, you were made by God for God. He loves you. And any tugging you have in your heart is not of your own. It's because God is calling you to himself. You see, but God gave everything. He didn't give a little bit. He gave everything. He gave himself. And the only way you and I can experience God, truly, is to come to the point and say, I give my entire life to you. Everything. My trust, my hope, everything. If you will do that, you can become a child of God today and begin a new journey. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray a prayer. If you want to pray it in the quietness of your heart, then we're going to have another prayer before we end here today to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's first start with this one, the most important one. You want to pray in the quietness of your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross, that you paid for my sins. I cannot be good enough no matter how hard I try. I stopped trying to be good enough, and instead I want to entrust my life upon you. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, all the things I've done wrong, both known and unknown. I give them there to, to you today. And I give my life to you. You're no more second, no more third. God, you are who I'm going to listen to by your help from this point forward. You are the boss. You're the God. You're the commander. You're the chief of my life. I resign from the executive position of, of CEO of my life, and I declare I am Jesus under Jesus' authority now. I give my life to you today. I ask you to fill me with your spirit now that I'll be able to walk the path that you have for me. With every head bowed, if anyone today say, Pastor, that was me. I, just, I prayed that prayer off. Give my life back. I see a quick show of hands. Anyone here this morning say, that would be me. Anyone this morning? Okay, thank you for being honest. Thank you for being honest. Praise God. Today's a new day for you. Today's a new day. Now, you can open your eyes. Many people, you can close them too if you want to. <laughs> okay. Many people have heard about Holy Spirit, but have never surrendered to Holy Spirit because you're afraid something weird is going to happen. Let me tell you something real wonderful in Scripture. You gentlemen would be so kind to put it on the Scriptures. I'm going to close with this. And it's found in Luke 11, verse 9. Listen, this is for everybody. This is not just for the pastor. This is for everybody. Jesus said something that Aaron talked about today. He said this, It's to your advantage that I go away that he may come. 
that he may come. Who's he? The Holy Spirit. He may come. Because Jesus emptied himself of all his godly strength and power, came down to be one of us. And everything Jesus did, I don't know if you realize this, everything Jesus did on earth, he did by the person and work of the Holy Spirit. He didn't use his godly power. He limited himself to humanity's power. So that means the same stuff that Jesus did, you and I can do. And he even said, it's to your advantage I go away. He says, greater works will you do because I go to the Father. Now, I don't know about you, but I need some greater stuff in my life. And I think we have a golden opportunity today to receive it. Just forget about all the stuff you've heard and worried about. It's real simple. It's real simple. It says in uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 9, And I tell you the truth, keep on asking, and you will receive what you're asking. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, listen to this, everyone who asks, that means you. Look at your neighbor say, you're in everyone. Who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Do you give, or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, listen to this, Will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? If you've given your life to Christ, even if you did it a few moments ago, right now we have an opportunity to ask the Holy Spirit to infill you, to empower you. It's not a one-time event, but this is opening the door. And when we're going to pray right now, some of you might experience a wave of emotion. Some of you might, something might be moving in your chair. You don't know what's going on, but God's a gentleman. You might even see, maybe even like uh, something may be going on with your mouth, and it's okay. But we're going to pray right now and believe for God right now. So you want to pray it after me right now, out loud, because I think, I think we all could use a refilling. Say, Lord Jesus, you promised that if I ask, I will receive. I'm taking you at your word. I'm asking you to baptize me with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. I ask you to fill my life right now. I yield my body. I yield my mind. I yield my tongue. I yield everything to you. And I ask you right now to fill me. I thank you that if I ask, you will do what I ask. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand if we could. Hey, guys, it's real simple. We make it so complicated. If you ask for it, you get it. Now it's an opportunity. We can get more opportunity in the future to help us walk out what God has installed in you. But what it is, it's a new day for you in the spiritual realm. It's an opportunity. It's a gateway for us to begin to cultivate a relationship with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we can begin to do things we've never done before. And I believe God's calling us to do that. Amen? I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way down as Esteban and the band lead us in the song called Holy Spirit. Let's go ahead and... Holy Spirit, you are welcome. You want prayer? Come down to the front. You want someone to pray with you? You gave your life to Christ today. Whatever it is, you just need someone to pray alongside of you. Come on down. Let's go on, sing it out. Holy Spirit. time. 
Amen. Listen, we're going to just play quietly. If you need to leave, we understand that. You're dismissed. But if you'd like to have prayer, we'd love to have you pray with us here in the front. We also want to invite you to class 201 right next door. It starts at 1230. But listen, if you want to come down for prayer, we're just going to join in with you. The Bible says where two or three are gathered, I'm in your area. I'm in your presence. So we want to be able to pray with you today. Otherwise, you guys are dismissed. Thank you so much for being attentive today, and God bless you.